for patients. We were just waiting for some late arrivals. Um, I'm very excited to announce this evening's program. Um, but before we get started, I just want to um, ask that you please silence or turn off your cell phones. We are recording tonight. Um, also, the concert itself is about 40 minutes, and we'll follow with a Q&A with the violinist Odessa Vallon and with Dave Burrell, who's the composer and pianist tonight. And I know Dave in particular is very excited to talk about this project um, and his um, process as an artist in creating the compositions. He's been working at the Rosenbach for over a year, um, doing research, uh, looking at our Civil War documents, particularly the letters, journals, photographs, and um, papers that we have. And a lot of those stories are about um, f uh, families living during wartime. And so that's how we came upon the theme for tonight's program, which is civilians living during wartime. And um, what he uh, found was just, uh, you know, here we are um, in the second year of the war. It's 150 years ago. And um, people are... Uh, Abraham Lincoln's writing to General McClellan urging him to take action on the battlefield, but people in states like Tennessee are already feeling uh, what it's like to live in uh, a country at war. Uh, there's uh, strong tendencies towards uh, Union and towards Confederacy in that state, and the anxiety of living during wartime is what is um, what we're going to hear in the program tonight, and, and also the joy and all the different emotions of living at that time. I do want to recognize that there is a typo in the program. It's uh, not the country. It's not. Um, it's Mama. I'm still hungry, so I'm sorry about that. But we'll fix it in time for Saturday. Um, and uh, without uh, this program would not have been possible without the funding of the Helen Keeler Burke Foundation. And we really thank them for helping to provide funding for the research and for the program tonight. So. Thank you and enjoy. This is so I just want to say that uh, we're very happy to have another year go by on this five year project. And uh, the theme is Civilians During Wartime. There are six compositions, and I'm starting with one titled Legends of Auction Block Runaways. And this title came from researching a number of different uh, books, letters, and several other institutions here in Philadelphia. Uh, the Union League and the Library Company of Philadelphia. And I came to find that I needed to look deeper into my own family history. And when I did look further, I found that uh, my family had originated from a plantation in Louisiana. And I will talk more about that next year when we look at the Emancipation Proclamation. I think that it would fit into that very, uh, very well. So enjoy this solo piece before I bring Odessa Balan on violin to do the second piece. Enjoy Legends of Auction Block Runaways. And picture me as an elder sitting down at the piano to tell a story to the extended community.
thank you for <clears throat> legends of auction block runaways. And like I said early, uh, earlier, hello, and uh, welcome to the second annual the Civil War um, concert. This one's called Civilians During Wartime. And I just finished performing solo a piece that illustrates auction block runaways. Uh, and the full title is Legends of Auction Block Runaways. I'd like to bring to the stage Odessa Balad on violin. This next piece that we will play in duet is about the loss of a family when their son goes off to battle and they don't receive any correspondence whatsoever. And it was a universal theme throughout most of the letters that I read in the Rosenbach's collection. So, the name of this piece is, Have You Seen My Son?
thank you for having seen my son. And um, next is three-way tie. And um, a lot of the staff wondered why I called it three-way tie. What does it mean exactly? And I said, well, the Christian Commission and the Sanitary Commission out of Washington connect with the war effort. Uh, the Christian Commission wanted to see if a soldier died a Christian death, and it was so much more important to die correctly. And the Sanitary Commission, <coughs> as I understand it, was funded more heavily, and they were more interested in keeping records, records of deaths and surgeries of the wounded. And the reason for the records were to inform the widows, or that in some cases that they were not, so they were entitled to a certain amount of money, a pension, or maybe they were not at all to get any money. So three-way tie, the Sanitary Commission ended up in uh, 1864 having fairs at different major cities to raise money for the war effort. And one of those sanitary fairs was held right here in Philadelphia, Louisville, New York, and many other cities. Enjoy three-way tie.
Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for three-way tie. And uh, we have a theme song titled One Nation. One Nation will be part of every future performance as well as this one. And it's the American Civil War theme song. And what we've done, I've done, is taken a motif from Yankee Doodle and another one from Dixie. And Elizabeth Fuller, our librarian, reminded me that Dixie was banned, couldn't sing it or play it until after the war. I think that's correct. And so it makes it more significant. But they are the motifs that we use in our One Nation American Civil War theme. And each year we will develop the motifs into a complex contrapuntal uh, mosaic, maybe, mosaic.
families that were directly affected by plantation collapse, slaves, and white civilians, for example, and or battles that affected the North's ability to produce the way they were accustomed to, left families with nothing, nothing to eat. And in this particular song we're covering, it's not a North-South uh, situation, it's an America, an American situation. But um, I wrote a letter to myself where I was a boy that didn't have enough to eat. And we're waiting for Mama to cook, and there's really enough for one child, and maybe there are three ch children there. So I give mine to my little brother and sister. My stomach's still growling. And that's it. We don't know where our father is and, uh, or when he's coming home or if he's dead. And there may be other men and other, of course, their neighbors too. They're in the same predicament. When you see the lights or the the candle go on next door, you're looking, are they going to eat? Are we going to eat? So that's the way that this song is uh, supposed to, to impact you.
Thank you. For Mama, I'm still hungry. The last one is um, code name Cheap Shot. And it's funny because while I was writing it, um, somebody asked me, I, well, I asked, so what do you think of this title? And uh, a staff member said, well, I don't know what, what you mean by that. And I said, well, if you're doing espionage and you find a bunch of troop movements and you report them to the enemy and thousands of soldiers are killed, I think that's a cheap shot. And she said, oh, okay, I, I understand that. I, I see what you mean. Um, but um, there's, there's a lot more to it. And um, what we did was we pictured, or what I did, I had the White House on one side and uh, Morse code telegraph, I used it as a prop. So the Morse code prop, and then the society ball is the other side of this composition. It's a two-part composition. And uh, in the society ball, some of the generals from the north were befriended and betrayed. And there's one spy in particular that was so good at it uh, that I have to mention her by name, and that's Rose uh, O'Neill Greenhow.
collect them themselves. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to just do a quick plug for a, a series of programs that we're going to have in the fall. Um, we're inviting military service members to come to the Rosenbach and uh, have an experience much like Dave has, where they look at our documents and respond with uh, programs. And we're going to exhibit their work in the fall. Um, if you're interested in hearing about upcoming programs, um, there's a survey in the you can fill out your email address and we'll contact you about those things. But um, if you have any questions for Dave or Odessa, feel free. Yes. Tell me uh, your experience of, of first being presented with materials here at the, uh, at the Rosenbaum. What's, your, uh, what's the real experience of? The, <clears throat> the experience... Uh, <laughs> The, the first time I had a residency, I told the um, people working with me that I had never done anything quite like this, and I needed to um, figure out what I was going to do. And um, it was it was. Um, Slavery in the Americas, take another look, something along those lines. And um, I had the material, and I started reading. And after I read for several weeks, I asked the librarian if I was on the right track. And she would help me and say, well, you might want to look at several other books. This book is good, but so are these two. And uh, after a while, I was very um, much interested in, well, I, I, I had figured out that I didn't know very much, but I was still building a concept. So that concept took me to two Nigerian drummers, and I asked if they wanted to play, because one played the balaphone and the other one played hand drums, and they could both double on either instrument. Um, but um, more importantly, I think, what happened to me was I realized that uh, the only way to do a good job would be to find out as much as I could about the subject and then start to edit out what wasn't necessary for maybe a one hour performance, something like that. And as the uh, performances went by and I listened back to the video, uh, audio, or looked at the uh, video, I saw exactly what I didn't like about what I did or what somebody else had, had not contributed, or just how to improve in general. And uh, <clears throat> then we went on to another subject, and I said, uh, well, I know I need more time than I had last time, so let me come in uh, several months earlier. And when I came in several months earlier and had uh, time to read through an entire book and keep notes, I found that I had developed a system of studying. Because uh, I, I study a lot, but it's only music. So this was uh, very good for me to get going and write more in the avant-garde mode and uh, have a different way of having my music sound not like everybody else that's composing avant-garde music. So that's the main thing that has come out of this this process. Other question? Um, yeah? I think, uh, you know, uh, of all the letters, I guess, that you read, um, was there anyone in particular that captured your imagination or resonated with set the tone for this suite of compositions? Yeah, <clears throat> several, and in many 
many instances reading letters over two and three times uh, in different contexts. They would show up in a, in a stack for a certain direction that we're following, and then that same letter would be over here on another day. And sometimes you have a lot of compassion and sympathy and sensitivity towards somebody when you read the letter, especially if you're reading with a, maybe a magnifying glass. And, and I got better as time went on understanding other people's handwriting. And um, I, I did receive a lot of help with all of this that I'm describing. But there was one whistleblower letter, I call it, because uh, someone was saying something about um, uh, Ulysses S. Grant's drinking. And uh, when Lincoln heard about it, when Abraham Lincoln, the president, heard about it, uh, everybody was afraid that heads would roll. But what Lincoln said, and I thought it was very funny, was, Find out what he's drinking and give it to all my generals. <laughs> and, uh, that's one of my favorites. But, uh, but I mean, you know, you get the idea from uh, just the, the, the first war or the first year of the war. And now we're not going year by year, but when we started, we had to start from the beginning. Um, we found that. Uh, all of the researchers uh, talking about the Battle of Manassas, for example, or something that happened much later in Kentucky that was relevant because some of the same officers uh, became generals maybe during that time. And you start to hear other storylines through the war story. And after a while you start to think that you know these people and you know their kids and uh, you know why something that was destined to fail. Uh, and a lot of what's on uh, C-SPAN in the last year contradicted things that I knew to be factual. And I started to like those debates because uh, I'm sure some of it was true and relevant. And uh, there was usually someone else with a counter argument. And I found that those were interesting uh, discussions on, on subjects that I knew a little bit about and felt like I could be uh, having my own opinion as well. And most everything in the war, uh, probably in every war, is like that. No, there were 14 dead. No, there were 4,100 dead. Uh, I can prove it. You know, and uh, it, it really becomes, well, why do we have to keep fighting anyway? I mean, but we do. And the main book, I think, for me, that helped me understand everything that I was looking at was the Drew Gilpin Faust book, uh, This Republic of Suffering, Death and the American Civil War. She's the uh, president of Harvard now, and she put a woman's sensitivity on the war uh, like no other book that I'd read, and would often go back several wars and forward several wars and show the similarities and the differences. And uh, I would look up from the book, sometimes angry, sometimes with tears in my eyes, sometimes wondering, well, how is this allowed to be done? Like some, the kinds of stories you hear now about Abu Ghraib and uh, Guantanamo and or just the in injustices that become overwhelming. And so you can very well see why they needed some kind of documentation. I think right around the time, the ending of the war, the, uh, the uh, photograph came into vogue. The 
Is that right? Elizabeth Fuller is sitting back there. Uh, it, was, it, was, it, it was around uh, um, a couple decades before. But, it was? Uh, yeah, but certainly um, used more, more and more frequently as, as the world went on. And more. So they started to see the, <clears throat> the, the, the carnage, the, the horror, the arms and legs amputated and piled up outside of the tent where the surgeons were working without any sanitation. So photography was underground and finally came out and you started to see photographs in the daily news. And people would think, oh my God, this is really serious. And I don't know what to do. Well, should I support it? What, I can't run away. What can I do? I have uh, a son, or maybe more, fighting. And who's going to lose? And what does it mean? And uh, another thing that was so interesting about what does it mean if you lose, uh, there's so many things that were at stake for losing. And I guess that's true in everyone, so I'm uh, ready to go into the uh, third year. Yes? I wonder if you were thinking at all or sort of reflections in the letters, uh, uh, considering that for this particular set, the individuals you were interested in were the individuals at home, a lot of them were the women and I guess older persons and children, and yeah. a reflection of, of what music meant to them at that time, either singing in church or music as comfort or raising spirits. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, we, we came across um, some hymns of the time, and we thought that... Uh, it's got to stem from some place. This uh, original composition has to come from some place in the war, the heart of the war. And oftentimes uh, they were singing in church. So I thought, okay, put a strand of church sounding music and make it sound exactly the same way that the chords were in the 1860s. So we did a lot of that. Other times I was told, well, if you have a vision of something and it has, maybe it's very, very, very far away from just that particular incident, like... Uh, the song Cheap Shot. It, uh, it, has, it has the telegraph in it. It has the society ball in it. And then it has intervals and voicings that were no, nowhere around at that time. And I think if I'm able to do that as a composer, I've done my job. I, I certainly don't want to copy the music of, uh, of the time, but I want to honor it. Odessa, what is it like playing with uh, our duo? How do you feel about that? Would you stand up and tell them? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think it's very interesting that you mentioned that because first thing I have to say about this particular project, um, and this is my second year with this project um, with Dave, I played last year also, is that it, it's a subject that is very near and dear to me because I consider myself an American. And I think that um, the subject of these pieces, you know, and, and what happened in that war, things just wouldn't be the way they are now if what happened didn't happen. I mean, things would just be different. I don't know if it would be better or worse or whatever. Everybody can have their own opinion about that. But it just wouldn't be today. It just wouldn't be. So with the wealth of knowledge that Dave you know, brings to the table with each piece, um, I find that 
you know, I'm the hungry one, you know, mom, I'm still hungry. I'm the hungry one that's wanting more and more information because he'll tell me about a piece and the notes on the page are just in black and white until suddenly he tells me about the piece. And suddenly I can't just play those notes to a metronome anymore. It's not, it just isn't that way anymore. The notes become more like a character and then my part is not a solo, it's a duet part with the piano, which is completely different from a violin standpoint. Usually the violin is the soloist, and the piano just plays chords in the background, and that's really nice. But in this case, you know, it really is a duet, you know, venture um, within the music, and so um, he's supporting my lines, and, and whatever I'm doing is in relationship to what he's feeding off, you know, feeding me. And all of that. So that's that's how I've been with this project. It's been it's very exciting for me. Oh yeah. And um, to to add to that, um, she asks a lot of questions. <laughs> so um, so we we really when we rehearse we have a lot of fun. And when my wife Monica comes home, she usually catches us both. Yeah, but what's so funny? You know, <laughs> say, um, well, it's funny because you know we're enjoying what and we're getting something accomplished. Yeah. And I reminded her if you come to a rehearsal and nobody's happy, it's not a good rehearsal. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but um, uh, we we do have uh, a, a a place now where we feel that a lot of our formulas work. Because when I first described, all right, we're going to do something where we have one melody running quickly and one slowly, and they're going to meet at the end. And uh, people are going to hear both melodies and hear the mumbo-jumbo, but they'll still be able to recognize both of them. And somebody said, uh, you can't do that. It's not going to work. And uh, I didn't know if it would work or not, but I tried it. And they were right, it didn't work. <laughs> so I, that, and, and it probably didn't work because they were too close together and you couldn't tell. So I, I spread them out. And um, then you could hear both of them much more easily. Uh, but you know, that's, I think, the nature of uh, composing new material as, as you go along. And I like to be a daredevil. I like to try something that might not work all the way and figure out how to uh, straighten it up. Yeah. Uh, the, the second and third song sounded like a rag to me. Yes. Was that intentional? I guess it yes. has to be. Yes, it was uh, from the, uh, the fair, and people walking around, so it had to be a two-step, and um, it was, uh, it could have gone on for a, a much longer period of time, I was going to speed it up, but it was very difficult key, and it kept changing keys, you know, so I think that if we do get a chance to do this music again in another context will probably stretch out on a lot of these songs that are just three, four minutes right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know we have concerts on Saturday at 2 and 7 and uh, I'm, uh, I'm plugging something that maybe <laughs> I shouldn't be plugging. Uh, uh, um, but uh, I'm going to turn it on over to Fair Fitzgerald. She's our assistant director of education. Does anyone have any more questions? We'll wrap up. Yes, yeah, Jonathan. Yeah, a couple, actually. I mean, you did the Bill of Sale for a Slave in 2006 and mm -hmm. the Portraits of Civil War Heroes in 2010 in this piece. Do you, do you envision a kind of you know, bringing all these uh, works together in a thinking? larger, you know, umbrella of civil war, or you, you're content to have them separate, you know, living kind of uh, 
They don't buy us in their own way. I would like to bring them together. I think that concept people, that um, is almost synonymous with funding people, <laughs> you know, that can say, I, I see a time when this would be very appropriate, the time being not now, but uh, I would work very closely with the museum to see if there's any possibility of that a sort of an extravaganza and uh, would love to have an opportunity to string everything together. But of course it would have to make sense and it couldn't go on forever, you know. Yeah. My other question is, um, I mean, you obviously have this extraordinary body of jazz compositions, jazz piano, I mean, you know, recordings, you know, the lore. Um, I'm just wondering how, since people have their own views of what jazz quote, is, and and, uh, and hearing you as a jazz composer and jazz pianist composing this music, I'm, I'm wondering if you could, uh, if it's possible to relate these compositions, you know, to the world of jazz. I mean, is there a connection, or is this another direction? Uh, you know, is the jazz embodiment in these compositions? Because I think, you know, the world out there of, of people probably, you know, have a view of jazz based on what they've heard in, in their own ways. And I think, um, I'm just wondering whether you can make that connection for people to this work and, you know, your jazz chops, your jazz influences, and just, you know, the presence of jazz uh, in this work. Is, because it has, a, obviously, a very neoclassical kind of uh, almost chamber music quality, uh, which you've done as a, you know, extraordinary jazz composer, jazz pianist. So, yeah. Where that question goes, let me take it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that uh, what, what you're saying is, is it really something that would stand up uh, maybe in a, in a jazz club? Well, in a jazz club, um, you'd probably have to do some editing. Couldn't have it with violin only, like you can here. And here we have the ambience as a seriousness of a um, research library, world renowned, and that we know the theme of the Civil War. And that really basically scares off a lot of people. I know it would scare me off <laughs> if I weren't commissioned to do it, probably. So um, I can't see it. The village vanguard says, one night only, Dave Burrell, Civil War. <laughs> and, you know, and the tickets are selling like hotcakes, but he's going to have all the all-stars and his... Uh, violinist, and it might be, you know, well, what's the point? You know, why is he doing that? Uh, is he so insecure with just playing at the museum that <laughs> can't he come up with another idea for another venue? But you know what? Uh, in in uh, Europe, uh, one time I was talking to Dave Brubeck, and he said, look, I'm going to play with a symphony, and I don't get to play what I want. And I said, why is that? He said, they wouldn't understand it. He said, the only things that they understand that I've written are Take Five and Blue Rondo. Honestly. And he said, I will play that with every symphony in, in Europe, and then I'm going to retire. <laughs> and, and I thought, you know, with the younger players and the, and the groups, now you'll see... I don't know what the names are anymore because it's like new age, black, white, Asian, urban, you know. And uh, they mean it. They're very serious about what they're doing. There's a violinist from Asia. There's another string instrument from Southeast Asia. Several Africans. And a computer. Computer. Um, drummers from Africa all mixed in with the Europeans, and there's 
usually only one American, if at all. And uh, they say, yeah, we're influenced by jazz. And several of our people are from conservatories. And everybody wants to know more about improvisation. But is there a law against us trying to express ourselves? We're all artists and we want to, you know, try. And these are, I mean, really young people coming to us back, backstage mm -hmm. and, and being criticized because they're not sort of really mastered, masters in any particular genre, but they're crossing over into all kinds of fields. So my, my answer is, um, if, if you have a desire to go off the page and start to experiment just without any residency and any reason to have to uh, succumb to anybody else's idea of what it is or what it's not, I feel that I should encourage that person. I feel that the, the kids that I play with now, you know, teenagers and in their early 20s, they look at me when they make a mistake as if to say, Oh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Burrell. And I say, Build on the mistake. Keep going. You know, don't stop. And uh, I think there should be more of that in the arts. You know, you just have an idea and somebody tells you, Oh, that's a stupid idea. What did you do? Well, I just poured all the syrup on the table and I made a face. <laughs> you know, say, well, go to your room. You know? I mean, but I mean, it, it's kind of like I'm not really knowing when to say that somebody can't make art. That's what I really mean. And I think that when you when you encourage an artist, you're doing something good. Um, the politics of it, I think. I, I can't, I can't get, get involved. Anybody? Okay. Do you have any questions you can approach Dave after that concert? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.